Aloha, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in to another week of Trauma Recovery University. I am your host, Athena Moberg, and with us in the green room is Bobby Parrish, your amazing co-host. And this week's topic is pre-verbal abuse. What is preverbal abuse? It is any type of abuse that happens to you before you are three years old. Yes, that means when you're an infant. Yes, that means when you're a toddler. Yes, these things happen way more often than we would like to talk about, that we would like to acknowledge, and we're going to unpack how to cope with these preverbal memories, some tips and tricks and strategies to navigate our way through the healing process when we are flooded with memories or we're unsure if they are memories from that young of a time, uh, preverbal, before we were three years old. So if you are listening on a podcast platform such as iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, SoundCloud, or even iHeartRadio, we want to welcome you. And we do want to remind you this is a video broadcast. So moving forward in 2016, you're going to be able to view these videos on iTunes. Or you can also go to youtube.com forward slash Trauma Recovery University TV. You can also find us on all Roku devices. We have our own Roku TV channel. And you can simply find us by going to the search area of your Roku device or your Roku television and typing in Trauma Recovery University. We do want to issue a trigger warning as this broadcast does discuss childhood abuse, specifically childhood sexual abuse. And Bobby is going to bring us up to date on everything regarding No More Shame November, and we're going to give you the contact information if you are triggered in Ireland or anywhere in the UK and in the United States, and we're going to give you all that information. Oh, and... Just as a thank you for being one of our loyal listeners, viewers, subscribers, or just an awesome survivor, we want to give you complimentary access to our entire library of downloadable one-page resources. These resources go with every single coinciding episode of that topic. Tonight's episode is pre-verbal abuse, so you would go to traumarecoveryuniversity.com, click on the tab that says downloadables, and you would search for the area where it says childhood abuse survivors and preverbal abuse, etc., as long as well as all 60 or 70 other episodes so far of Trauma Recovery University. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to your amazing co host, Bobby Parrish, who will take care of anything that I might have completely forgotten about. Take it away, Bobby. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad I'm that, that you're here, here. and we're and so we're thankful so that you're that here. You're here. Oh, and I'm getting an echo. Are you getting an echo, Miss Athena? No, you sound fantastic. Okay, good. <laughs> um, again, we want to issue trigger warning. This is a discussion about childhood abuse and specifically childhood sexual abuse. Um, so if you want to reach out to someone, if you're in crisis, um, just stop the video, turn it off, pause it, walk away from it. We will be here. Um, if you're watching us live, we'll be here pre will be here recorded later on YouTube or Roku device or on the podcast. Um, if you're watching us already or listening to us, just go ahead and pause it, put it away, and you can come back to it later. There's um, a lot of information that we share about that's really hard, and we don't want you to be triggered and feel badly. We want you to watch these videos and feel better, uh, not worse. So if you're triggered or if you're in crisis, we want to encourage you to reach out to RAIN, um, and that's the Rape, Abuse, Incest National Network. They have a crisis chat feature on their website, RAIN, R-A-I-N-N dot org, and they also have a toll-free number that works in the States, and I think Canada, and that's 1-800-656-H-O-P-E. If you are in the UK, 
we have a lot of uh, our community existing in the UK, you can reach out to the Samaritans. And specifically, if you'd like to get help via email, you can reach out to Joe, J-O, at Samaritans.org. Um, she specifically is helpful for survivors of sexual abuse. And we want to encourage you to reach out to either one of those resources should you be triggered by this video or should you just simply be in crisis and need some urgent help. Um, this isn't meant to be any kind of therapy or therapeutic broadcast. We're here to share information um, and provide you with the kind of education that you need in order to walk forward in your recovery. It is No More Shame November, our second annual No More Shame November. And during this month, we try to hit uh, the social media circuits really hard with advocacy and awareness campaigns. We have a button on our nomoreshameproject.com website. If you hop over to that and click on Pinnables, you'll bring that up and you'll be able to see the button that Athena so beautifully designed. You can use it as an avatar on social media or you can put it on your blog. And we will be republishing the um, November 2014 anthology uh, here in the next couple of weeks. It's being put out by our new publisher, Book Trope. And we will let you know uh, when that happens. If you aren't signed up for our newsletter, uh, hop over to the website, nomoreshameproject.com, and um, put in your name and your email address to so make sure you get notified of upcoming events. Um, the anthology that was due to be published this month is on a bit of a hold process because we did not have enough material to publish an anthology that we thought was of significant length. So we are going to be adding in some submissions that we've gotten in the last few months. If you would like to submit something to be in the anthology, um, you can go to nomoreshameproject.com and there's a tab that says book. And on, if you click that, everything that you need is there on the web page in order to provide us with a submission. Our goal is to publish a new anthology every November during No More Shame November. Uh, we're doing our best. And um, last year it happened, this year it has not yet happened. So um, it all depends on how many submissions that we get. So um, I'm trying to think of whether we have any other announcements, and I don't think so. I don't think we do. I do want to give a very special uh, shout out to Julie Ann, who's Yay! amazing. It's like it's 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and she's here with us. And I want to wave to Donald. Donald is here with us, and so is Kate. Hi, Kate. And I feel like I'm forgetting someone. Maybe I'm not forgetting anyone. I know that there are some lurkers. And by the way, we welcome you if you're lurking. What lurking means, and it's not like a really creepy, weird, like peeping Tom sort of thing that you guys might think that it means. What lurking means is that you're here, you're watching, or you're following our Twitter feed. Hashtag no more shame and the little banner what it says on the little banner here and you're not really asking questions or talking back or um, Interacting with us and that's completely fine. You do not have to interact with us But if you would like us to say hello to you and greet you then please say hello um, But we do see on our software that it shows many more viewers than have said hello so we want to welcome you especially and um, just thank you. You guys are the reason that we show up every single week. We love you. And we are here to support your recovery journey. I got the most incredible email from one of our YouTube community members slash Twitter community members. Um, we get emails from you guys every single week. This one particular email just really brought tears to my eyes. And I just, I'm really grateful. Um, for every single email and message that you guys send us and we read every one of them personally and um, thank you thank you for taking the time to reach out to us personally and share 
um, just transparently and courageously your truth with us. We we value each and every one of you. So um, I won't go mushy gushy on you for too too long. We're going to jump into content, but. I just didn't want there to be um, an evening that went by that you guys don't know how much we deeply care about you, each and every one of you. I know this is a long journey, and it can feel very lonely and like people don't understand, but I assure you, specifically on this topic of pre-verbal abuse, abuse prior to the age of three years old, I understand this topic is hard. It is triggering. It's incomprehensible, unexplainable. It's horrifying to think that anyone would want to hurt a precious little baby that's younger than three years old, hasn't even made it to the effing fours yet. When my son made it to the effing fours, oh lordy, yeah, that was the time when I was ripping my hair out. But you guys, I mean, all kidding aside, I mean, child abuse is horrible to think about. Bobby and myself both have gone through significant healing from pre-verbal memories, um, Bobby more so. Um, she shared this morning in CSAQT, Child Sex Abuse Question Time, if you're curious, we're gonna talk about that later in the broadcast, um, that she went through extensive healing for five years. I, I don't wanna misquote you, Bobby. I think you said it was like four hours a week for five years. Yep, four hours a week, two hours, twice a week for five years to heal from this extensive child abuse that started pre-verbal and went on through, uh, through years, you guys. So um, yes, we have many of you that have expressed to us just, a, you can't even find the words to describe just how atrocious and disgusting this is and who would ever, and wow, really? And I, I mean, we're here to tell you yes, really. And, um, you're not alone. You're not alone if you found this video and it hits you right in the solar plexus. You're not alone. You're in good company with us. And please uh, view our YouTube channel, our Roku channel. Um, you know, look us up. Make sure that you, that you feel safe even being around us. But send us a message. Let us know if you want to heal in safe community with us. We have virtual safe groups set up and organized to facilitate your healing journey. And we value each and every one of you. And we hope that we're able to add value to you tonight. Bobby, did you yes. want to, uh, to discuss? I was just going to say we welcomed in five new members to our support group today, yeah. to one of our support groups. Um, so that that's awesome. And we just really want to encourage you, if you would like to heal in safe community, we're going to be sharing later exactly how to do that. And it works really well if you do it like we ask. <laughs> works better if you do it like we ask. Otherwise, it takes months. And we don't want it to take months. We, we feel really bad when it takes months. Um, anyway, so. yes, we would just, we would love to have you. And it was so awesome to bring five people um, into our family today and let them feel the love and the support and the encouragement that is in our support groups. Um, they are easily, as long as I've been doing this, both in my recovery journey and in my journey as a therapist, this is, they are by far the best group um, of supporters that I have ever seen. So I'm so impressed with them. Yeah. And, and it's because of you guys. It's because of because you guys are also compassionate and incredible and willing to share your journey with us. That's why the support group is so amazing. And we're yeah. not claiming some sort of like fame, like, oh, we're such awesome leaders of this group. You guys are the magic. You guys are the ones that make this amazing. And um, we want as many of you as possible to experience that. So if you feel safe and you feel like you've gotten to know us a bit and you want to reach out to us, we're going to walk you through that process later on in this, in this broadcast towards the end. Um, Bobby, I wanted to maybe um, to d discuss a little bit um, just some, um, some of the conversation that went on today um, during – child sex abuse question time, which is our UK chat, you guys. Um, I just thought, I thought that it was really, I mentioned this to you in the green room um, before we went live. This particular topic has brought people out of the woodwork that don't normally, yeah. they, they don't normally participate in our weekly chats. 
um, or speak up rather. They don't normally speak up and make, make themselves known or, or um, you know, take the time to sort of check in and, and put it, give us their input on the topics because, you know, scheduling or perhaps they're introverted or shy or, or they just prefer to read about the topics that we discuss and not participate. But this, this topic brought uh, more people out of the woodwork to um, be in community with one another than other topics normally do. And I just thought that was really phenomenal and wonderful, Bobby. Yeah, it was, um, it was very interesting. I mean, we have a good cadre of people who show up every week for our Twitter chats, and we have three of them. So um, we've got a, a community of people that show up regularly. Um, and it's not unusual to have, you know, two or three new people every week. But today, yeah, the topic today really brought people out. And I was sharing with Athena that the concept of preverbal abuse having an impact on a survivor can be somewhat controversial within the psychological community. Not every mental health professional believes that um, pre-verbal abuse can affect uh, a developing child or can um, have an impact on them or create consequences that um, well, you know, that we see, you know, the PTSD, the anxiety, you know, the flashbacks, the nightmares, everything um, that will come along with memories of abuse from when you are verbal as opposed to pre-verbal. So I'm not sure whether it brought out more people because they were curious about the topic or whether they knew that it somehow applied to them and they wanted to get some information. Um, so it was very, very interesting. Um, I wanted to share with you guys my stance about preverbal abuse. And my stance comes from my personal experience. I heavily believe that preverbal abuse impacts the victim. Um, and I, I can't 100% say that because of my experience being victimized when I was that young. Um, I processed memories, you know, I went through the healing process, but my living demonstration of that is my son. When my son was seven months old, he was mauled by a dog. And it was a very significant injury resulting in reconstructive surgery and um, multiple stays in the hospital. And by all rights, if there's no such thing as preverbal trauma impacting a child, he should be fine. But he's not. He's got PTSD. And I know that little boy. And I know what he was like before he was mauled. And I know what he has been like since that happened. And he went from being a self-assured, confident little guy that explored his world to someone that felt no safety and peace in anywhere except in my arms. Um, he changed. That day changed him. He no longer felt safe in this world any place but physically attached to me. Um, he still suffers. He doesn't remember what happened, but he still suffers. And so anyone who will tell you that pre-verbal abuse, pre-verbal things like that that happen to us don't have an impact on us when we're older, you're so wrong. <laughs> I hope you never have to have the personal experience of finding out that we're right. Um, I hope you never have anything happen to a child who is pre-verbal. Um, I don't I don't want anyone to learn that way. That's not what I'm saying, but I've lived that and I know that and it does in fact impact children and it can seriously change the way that they cope with the world from that point forward. So 
I wanted to share that because I want to validate everyone out there who has sustained pre-verbal abuse and who the world, perhaps mental health professionals, perhaps other people have said to you, oh no, that happened, you can't remember that. Well, okay, maybe we don't remember what happened, but that doesn't mean that it didn't alter who we are. Absolutely. So, I want to. I just want to acknowledge the work that you're doing as a mom, Bobby, and just how you've been such a safe place for your son. And I mean, well done, mom. He feels safe with you. And I mean, he's. I've met him personally, you guys, and he's quite the young man. He is one of the most polite people I've ever met in my life. He's so helpful and kind, and he's very funny and um, and witty. And I, I just enjoyed getting to know him just for the little bit that I did get to know him briefly. So, but well done, mom. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. He, uh, he's a good boy. He's a, a wonderful young man. Um, but we, we've had a rough road. Uh, it hasn't been easy. But no. um, I, I, it definitely. It's not, it's not easy, Bobby. No. It's not easy. None of this pre-verbal talk is easy. I mean, that's kind of an oxymoron, pre-verbal talk. But um, none of this discussion that we're having about pre-verbal abuse is is easy. But we're here to talk about the issues that are not easy. And uh, I know you already responded on Twitter, but just for the benefit of our of our viewing audience on iTunes and YouTube and Roku TV, I was hoping that I could um, maybe ask some questions and make some comments from our Twitter feed since this is a live interactive broadcast Q&A every Monday, you guys, 6 p.m. Pacific. Is that okay, Bobby, if I, if I um, pose a question for you so we could discuss this um, on the video? Yeah. Awesome. So, um, so we want, we want, <laughs> I get, I gave you a whole bunch of leeway to say no there, didn't I? I sort of was like, this is what we're going to do, right? <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, at first I want to greet, um, I want to say hello to Donald and, um, I want to welcome Melissa back and say hello to Denise and, um, and Philly and, um, congratulations on your book, Donald. You're awesome. And I want, I wanted to let you guys know that um, one of our viewers, Kate, has asked a very, um, very relevant question, and that is, do pre-verbal abuse memories come in like flashbacks, which can be very vivid, or are they just a faint knowledge that something happened? And Bobby's succinct answer was both. But I, I would like to maybe just just discuss that for a moment. And um, and Sarah, I know you're having a really rough time, honey. We love you, and we're super glad that you're here. So please stay in safe community with us here on this chat. We're here for you. Um, Bobby, should we um, expound upon that just a little bit? I know that um, for me personally, like my, my pre-verbal, I was talking off the air about this, that some of my pre-verbal abuse, it, it manifests itself in um, physical abandonment. Like if for some reason, like for instance, I woke up in a different, I woke up in, my husband and I had fallen asleep on the couch together and he had gone into the room to go to sleep. And this is several years, this is probably three, three or four years ago. Um, but when I woke up and I was by myself, I didn't even have words. I was just, I was in my own home. I'm a full blown adult like almost 40 years old at the time, but I was inconsolable. I was weeping, ugly crying, snot all over. I, for some reason, could not believe that he would go into another room without me to go to sleep. My poor husband. I mean, God bless the man. He's got so much patience with me. But that is obviously, Bobby, I would love to hear your comment. In my personal and professional opinion, just in the research that I've been doing over the past, you know, however long, I feel like that was definitely something that was very old, 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 probably pre-verbal. What are your, what are your, what are your thoughts on that, Bobby? I agree. We were talking off the air before we came on and about the the response to pre-verbal abuse is much more primal um, because our brain at yeah. that point run so much more on instinct and um, instinctual responses than it does I mean there's no there's not complex cognition when you're that age and so more often than not you know when a when a nine-month-old you know 
is out exploring and reaches out and grabs something that's hot, you know, the immediate thing they're going to do is jerk their hand back and then they're not going to sit there and have a lengthy discussion inside their head about, you know, why was that, why did that hot thing burn my hand? What should I do differently next time? Um, no, they're just going to scream and they're going to start to cry. And so when we have those kind of primal reactions to things that happen, that can be an indicator that um, you sustained some abuse around an issue like that pre-verbally. And it can be, and that abuse can take any form. So it's, you know, pre-verbal abuse is not always sexual abuse. It can be neglect. It can be, you know, emotional. Babies that are screamed at and, you know, yelled at will respond much differently socially with people than babies who are held and loved and related to and have a chance to socialize with a variety of different people in a variety of different environments. Um, so that preverbal abuse can be the same, any category, the same kind of abuse that we would have um, when we're verbal. So if a child is abandoned you know, and left on their own for long periods of time, there's going to be some after effects. Um, that's not, that's not unusual. I wish that it were, but it's not. Um, Athena, do you want me to put up the one page? Yeah. Um, Billy, Billy had just made a comment that um, whenever she had explained some of her preverbal memories or memories that didn't have words to go along with them, that they had they had affirmed her by saying, "Well, if it looks like a duck and talks like a duck, then it's a duck." Like, hello, if you have that deep knowing that something yeah. happened in that area, like me being a full fledged, fully functioning adult looks at a situation like my sixty year old husband walking into the next room to go to sleep in our bedroom instead of you know, because we'd fallen asleep, like, instead of staying on the couch where he's going to wake up with a stiff neck, like, I mean, that, you know, anyway, yes, hello, like, the response I had was a primal response. I mean, I literally couldn't sleep. I cried for hours and hours, and, like, I don't, I can't remember ever, ever responding to him or doing anything like that to that degree, and can I put my finger on exactly what it is? Can I go, oh, I know what that was. That was this memory that I have from my child abuse. And now I'm just all done. I processed that memory. Yay, we're done. Like, that's not really how it goes. <laughs> so if you guys are having these, um, these flashbacks or these, these things that are a little bit curious that you just you know that it leads to something, uh, you know, write that down. Like, add that to your journal for your recovery. Um, definitely reach out to your safe community members. Has anybody ever experienced this? Get some affirmation. Really go down that rabbit hole in a safe place when you're able right. to ground yourself. You know, Get that professional help that you need from that therapist or from your safe community members or from, you know, just when you work through things, you guys, it's important at your own pace for you to, for you to go through this recovery journey. You need to go through your recovery. You can't go around it, under it, or over it, or it will rear its ugly head when you least want it to later on down the road. So um, I digress. I get, Bobby, you should yes. probably pull up that one page. Sorry. But yeah. Yes. You know, I want to I, I wanna validate research. everybody. <laughs> what? Yes. There was a piece of research that came out this week that I absolutely loved that showed that the power of a therapeutic alliance um, in the recovery process of trauma survivors. And it actually showed that the power of the therapeutic alliance, meaning the relationship between the therapist and the client and the trust that is established in that relationship can actually be more powerful than the type of therapy that is used um, you know, like whether it's cognitive behavioral or Jungian or family systems, that the healing 
the most healing comes from the therapeutic alliance and that that long term because you don't establish a therapeutic reliance alliance reliance sorry that was a Freudian slip in six sessions you probably aren't even going to establish a healthy therapeutic alliance in 10 sessions recovery from trauma takes can take years and that's where you see the power of that therapeutic alliance come in um, and to me that's one more reason why you know you need to establish a relationship with someone a healing professional who can go the long haul with you that that's so important um, and if it's taking you a long time uh, in therapy to feel like you're making progress that there's nothing wrong with that that for some of us it takes it takes a while and you're not doing anything wrong so we, don't worry about that we've been in therapy for a long time I mean not there like we've been in recovery for a long time like I'm just wanting to say yes yes and amen to what you just said because if I would have put a time limit on my healing, I never would be here with you guys. I wouldn't be experiencing the level of deep healing that I'm experiencing in my recovery journey that I'm experiencing now if I would have been like, well, I already healed. I already went to therapy like a good girl. I'm super done now. Done. Totally done. Like, it's been 15 years, guys, and I'm still recovering. And... I'm not redoing anything. I'm literally still uncovering the layers of the onion down to more trauma, more trauma, more trauma, more trauma. And occasionally I'll see something come around that's familiar, but it's, it's new stuff, guys. New stuff, new memories. Please do not limit yourselves. Please do not rush yourselves through your recovery journey, especially if it's pre-verbal stuff, you guys. This is hardcore, right, Bobby? Yeah, it is. It is. It is harder to recover from the pre-verbal abuse than it is the abuse that occurs when we've got verbal skills. And yeah. we'll talk about that a little bit in the one page. Yeah, we can't really talk our way through like the Did I cut you like, off? talk our way. Oh no, no, no. We're good. We're good. I know there's a little bit of a delay. We have a little bit of a delay. It's good though. We're good. <laughs> Let's pull up. Sorry, our audio is not the best. Okay, let's do it. Let <laughs> us do the thing. We can do the thing. We can. We can do the thing. Okay. Present to everyone. Yay! Okay. So pre-verbal memories and abuse. Preverbal abuse is abuse that occurs before we have adequate language skills. And this is typically between the ages of birth up until three years old. And the reason that is, is because science has determined that at the age of three, the brain goes through a seismic, I mean, huge shift in how it processes information. Up until about age three, we, we process memories more in a sensory format so what does something taste like what does it feel like what does it smell like what does it sound like but when we hit about three years old our brain does this shift and now they start you should guys should see me here working with my hands um, <laughs> now it starts to sort information and store it according to language and so things that were stored by our brain when we're three years and younger are stored in a whole different filing system than the things from three-year-old forward so that's why it can be difficult to access those pre-verbal memories and that pre-verbal abuse to process it and here this is what I talked about many people think that abuse which occurs in infancy and early toddlerhood cannot affect a child because they can't remember it but that isn't true. Early abuse is known to cause a child significant anxiety with symptoms similar to post-traumatic stress disorder. Also, they can have language and social skill delays. So many, and also, this is interesting too, many survivors of pre-verbal abuse develop dissociation as a coping mechanism. 
And I think that's because dissociation is one of the most primal coping mechanisms. And it's also yeah. one of the few that's available to a child. I mean, it's not like, you know, an, a 10-month-old is going to get up and run away um, and they don't have the words to cry for help. Um, that dissociation is one of the very few coping mechanisms they have available to themselves. And, and it so, keeps them alive. Exactly. But <laughs> like many coping mechanisms, it's a double-edged sword. Because although it keeps them alive and it helps them to survive their childhood, and I know this because dissociation was my primary method of coping with my childhood, but then it turns around and bites you in the hiney because it makes recovery harder because you have dissociated and you dissociate in therapy when things get hard and you have problems accessing your memories of the abuse to process them because you dissociated. So it's kind of, thank you for helping me still be alive, but now could you go away so I can actually have a life I want to live? Yeah. Um, we have a question that just came in, Bobby. Okay. From Billy Ann. Yes. She wants to know, how do you get past the feeling of self-doubt that you were hurt by another and get to the healing? You know, <laughs> that is all about, that's about two things. That's yeah. about developing your self-worth. And that's about developing your self-confidence. And within, and into, he, yes, healing intuition. Exactly. I was going to say, and within that self-confidence um, or intertwined with it needs to be the healing of relying on your intuition we learned to reject our intuition when we were children because our intuition told us something that was contrary to the grooming by our abuser and their enablers. And so we learned to discount it. Well, now you have to learn how to trust it again. And you have to learn to be confident in your trust of it. And you also have to deem yourself worthy of speaking the truth. If you don't love yourself, it doesn't matter how much truth you know, you're not going to stand up for yourself. Um, but when you love yourself, then you're going to see that truth of wor as worthy of being held rather than doubted. But make no mistake, that's a difficult issue, and that is a core, core issue to survivor recovery. You cannot fully recover unless you recover your self-worth. It's just, it's one of those, it's one of the chief lies that our abuse tells us, and it's one of the chief truths that we must grasp in order to recover. I would have to say, first of all, I agree, Bobby, with everything you just said, and I would have to say that even being in recovery for over a decade, my deep healing and the healing of my self-worth and my self-confidence never, ever, ever came until I was in safe community with other survivors who had lived through what I had lived through. And, you know, I think so much of that is about the loss of shame. Because when you're in community, shame can't, can't stand being in community. When you share your experience with others and they go, oh, my gosh, I get it. I understand and you get validated and you no longer feel like you have to hide and pretend that everything's okay um, then you can truly show up as who you are and then guess what when you show up as you truly are and you get loved your self-worth comes back you realize you don't have to put on a face you don't have to put on a mask you don't have to pretend you're someone else anymore because all of these people get it and they love you. So just, just um, as you are. That's Warts right. And all, shame yep. and all, doubt yep. and all, confusion and all. all well, of you it. know, I think, you know, Athena and I try very hard to be very transparent about where we are in our recovery journeys. And neither one of us is ever, you know, I can stand here and say never for myself, and I promise you I can stand here and say never for Athena as well. We will never tell you that we have got our acts together, that this is it, we're completely recovered, we're perfect, boom, moving on. Nope, um, never. 
It's we, a journey. That's it's why a it's a journey. journey. <laughs> it's a journey. Now, we may be a little further on down the road than some of you, um, but I promise you that we're here to tell you that we're not perfect, and you know what? That's okay. We feel confident in telling all of you we're not perfect, but we know we're okay. And that's where we, that's the place we want you to be in, to be able to say, you know what, I've still got a slew of crap on my abuse sled to haul around after me, but I'm still okay and I'm still lovable. And so. you very much are. You are very lovable just as you are. I think this is a perfect broadcast for us to remind each and every one of you that wherever you are in your recovery journey, perhaps as Julianne, one of our UK viewers, just tweeted in, perhaps you are contemplating the fact or having having a deep thinking feeling that perhaps preverbal abuse is in fact part of your truth and part of your story. I want you to know you're not alone. You're deeply loved. There are thousands of other people that are doing this right alongside you, just in other areas of the world, and we have. A, a good number of them, hundreds of them, <laughs> in private secret groups healing together. So we invite you to reach out to us to heal in safe community and just know that you're not alone. Please know that you're not alone. This is a very delicate and, like Bobby said, controversial topic. You are not alone, and we would love to help facilitate your recovery journey. Yes, we actually we have a survivor from Namibia. In one of our groups now and so it's so cool to see this spreading into um, other parts of the world and um, I'm it's we just so honored Ken we have Kenya um, Singapore Portugal um, well we I, I, I don't know them all by heart but we have 54, no. 54 countries yeah it is, it is so cool. So I promise you, not only will you get support, but you will get a multicultural experience. There you go. Should we ever get together, we'll have like a multicultural potluck. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, let us go on. Next paragraph. Ooh, um, huh. Dominique, Dominique, I'm so sorry. Dominique just uh, tweeted in a very, very, very relevant question. This is, Dominique, if you're listening... I hope you can hear this. I hope you're not only tweeting. I hope you're watching and listening as well. This happened to me, Bobby, hmm. this exact situation. My abuser spitefully shared a pre-verbal incident. How do I know if I'm having a real memory or just visualizing their words? I think that's one of these things that will come in time, I'm not sure if right now in this moment, you're going to be able to prove whether that happened or not. Um, I think it's going to take some time. You're going to talk about it in therapy, talk about it with your people in safe community, uh, see if it feels right and true to you. Um, but, you know, I am a significant proponent of the fact that we do not have to recover each and every one of our memories of abuse in order to heal. We have to recover, recover things about ourselves, like our self-worth, our feeling that we have power, our capacity to exercise our power, um, our self-confidence, you know, the fact that we are not to blame for our abuse. We have to recover, you know, the confidence to know that it was not our fault and we have to lose the shame um, so I would say even not I would, I would even tell you not really to stress out about that because if you work to recover the things that happened to you when you were verbal it should more than likely go backwards and heal the things that happened to you preferably but I would also encourage you to add some expressive modalities to your therapy. And we'll talk about those here in a few minutes. Wonderful. I, Thank you so much, I, Bobby. I love expressive therapies. They're my favorite. And here we go right here. 
Dominique, excellent segue. Because preverbal of use is not stored according to associated language, it can be very difficult to access and process when we're adults. It often takes non-verbal therapies to process preverbal abuse. Things like play therapy, art therapy, movement therapy, pet therapy, psychodrama, and even equine therapy, which I have become quite a fan of. Um, and again, that is because our trauma from preverbal before we're three and that cosmic shift happens in our brain, those memories are not stored with any kind of language cues attached to them. You can sit in front of your therapist probably and talk for 20 hours and it's not gonna hit that spot. But if you sit down with your therapist and you do art therapy for 20 hours, I can pretty much promise you're gonna hit that spot. Mm. Um, it's a little scary, but you know what? I mean, if, if we're interested you know, in healing, it's good. Yeah, it is. And you know what? My personal experience, um, I took some art therapy classes at um, in the university grad program, and then I've done art therapy myself, is that it's not as frightening when it's art therapy. Because it, it's almost like it gives you a little bit of distance. I, it may not apply to all people, but personally, I found art therapy to be somewhat of a comforting process. Um, I like it a bunch. I'm not a big fan of psychodrama. <laughs> and maybe can that's you, just my personality. Can you just describe briefly? I, I, I know what psychodrama is, but, but someone asked me earlier what that even was. So okay. um, what is psychodrama, Bobby? <laughs> <laughs> psychodrama is a type of therapy where you act out. Um, situations that remind you of your abuse or where you confront your abuser. Um, it, it is like a stage version. And the reason why we can use it, expressive therapies, is because you don't always have to use language with it. It can be a matter of acting things out without words. Um, that can be helpful. And when you're up there and you're playing things out, you know what, and I've even seen it with when the person who has the memory that they're sharing, they're the director. So they get to sit in the audience and tell the actors what to do. And that gives them a safe separation between the memory and themselves. And it also gives them a sense of power. And that's one of the reasons that I really like psychodrama. Um, but if you're a child, if you have a child who is abused or has something something traumatic happen to them, like my son had happened to him, play therapy, play therapy, play therapy, play therapy, play therapy. I can't say that enough. Please do not, do not send your child to a talk therapist. I'm begging you. It's not going to be as helpful as play therapy. Play is a child's language. Now, if they're 12 years old or 13 years old, absolutely knock yourself out. They can okay process things, especially if they're 15, 16 years old. But if they're younger than 12, Mm, I really have a hard time. It, it, I don't know why it's one of my pet peeves when a parent sends a child in to do talk therapy because that's not their language. Their brain is not that fully developed yet. Um, you know, we now have research that shows that the human brain, that prefrontal cortex that controls your long range planning and complex problem solving doesn't fully develop until you're in your early 20s. So play therapy, absolutely play therapy. If you have a child who had something traumatic happen to them, play therapy is the answer. And I've even done some play therapy with adults. So um, 
I think I would love to do play therapy or even art therapy. And I know some of you that have been with us since the very beginning of this broadcast will remember me sharing with you that the whole reason I even began my recovery journey is because I had a family member that had experienced abuse and I intuitively just knew that I immediately needed to get them some professional help. And that person, Bobby, that I told you about, mm -hmm. Uh, she did talk therapy with me, but she did play therapy with yes. my family member. Right. Yes. Yeah, and was able to confirm everything and sort of uh, begin the healing process. Right. And then, and it, and honestly, you guys, if you do have someone, we have a video on this channel that talks about when your child reports abuse. Um, if, when if you have a family member that reports abuse if they're a young family member and you take them to a play therapist, there is a chance that they will never have a really long drawn out recovery journey yes. like you. That's right. I mean, there has never been another area of, I mean, I'm not saying that the recovery shouldn't be happening to this family member because they really should be in recovery for a couple of things. But, but that's not for, that's not for me to judge. That is for them because they're an adult. But, um, but if you and I, and if Bobby and I and all of our community members that experienced such trauma at a young age were immediately taken to have our trauma addressed by a play therapist um, or someone who could help us process the trauma, in all likelihood, you guys, we would all not be sitting here. This would not be a YouTube channel. We would not still be in recovery. We would not be... 10, 20, 30, 40 years later, still recovering from the trauma because it wouldn't have damaged our immune system. It wouldn't have caused us to have PTSD. We wouldn't still be healing. We wouldn't still be uncovering new memories. I mean, there is a huge chance that that would be the case. Am I correct, Bobby, in your opinion? Yeah, you are correct. Um, and what that, what it should do is cut off the road to complex post-traumatic stress disorder because you're not allowing that PTSD response to be set into the child's personality like it would be should the child be enduring the therapy and not getting any help for it. Um, now, again, as a living example, you know, here's my son who was mauled by the dog when he was seven months old and I got him help, but he still has some struggles. So it's not going to make it go away down to zero, but it is going to make it much more tolerable and not as damaging. Um, and I agree, Athena, if you and I had gotten the help that we needed when we were young, we probably wouldn't be here. That's, no. I mean, we'll be, we would be symptom free, but I don't, I don't think we'd be here. I don't think so either. And I know that this is such a controversial topic. I almost want to record a video on it. I'm not saying I'm grateful for my abuse, you guys. That's ridiculous. But I am grateful that I'm here. I'm grateful that I have gotten the opportunity to meet some of the most incredible humans I've ever met in my entire life. I'm grateful for the opportunity to have met Bobby through my recovery journey and, and of childhood sexual abuse. I'm grateful to be experiencing the level of joy that I'm experiencing in my life right now because I've addressed the level of pain that I was experiencing. When you numb the pain, you also numb the opportunity for joy. And I was numbing my pain through busyness, through uh, overworking, through over exercising, Food. through food, through I mean you name it, you guys, and I've and I've used it to numb. I just have. I mean, I, I mean, actually, I'm not a drug person because I was um, abused horrifically by drug addicts, and so I, I mean, by the grace of God, I never became a drug addict, and I never became an alcoholic. But I'm not saying I've never used alcohol to numb because I have, and I'm not saying that I've you know that I could never be a drug. A, a drug addict because it, it could happen to anybody I'm sure but you guys if it's out there I've used it to numb and when I numbed that pain I numbed my potential for joy so 
anyway, what I'm saying is I'm grateful to be on this recovery journey and where I am in my recovery journey because I get to interact with all of you. I get the opportunity to sit here and transparently share my, you know, bare naked soul with you and in turn give you the permission you need to share your bare naked soul with hopefully a safe community member or a therapist or someone and just know that you're not alone. You're not alone and you're not the only person in the whole wide world that this has ever happened to. There is an entire YouTube channel dedicated to it. There are books and books and volumes and volumes and entire sections of libraries dedicated to childhood sexual abuse. You are not making it up. You are not alone on this journey and we are so blessed to be here even though it means that we had to survive it too. So um, yeah, I think yep. that's, impor that's important. It is. It is very important. Yeah. Um, this last paragraph here it says that supervisors, supervisors, where did that come from? Wow. <laughs> supervisors. I don't know. Isn't that bizarre? What a strange word to pop out of my mouth. Anyway, survivors rarely have clear memories of preverbal abuse. We may have a flash or what I call a snapshot of abuse. So just a picture frame. Um, or a, a, a snapshot of our perpetrator, but it rarely comes together as a string of memories that we can play like a movie, like you can probably do with the abuse that happened after you have become verbal. But the most telling signs of preverbal abuse are the resulting symptoms and emotions associated with that abuse. Okay, so if you are four years old and you have so much anxiety that you can't cope with going to preschool or um, being alone in a room, um, you don't want people to touch you, you know, those are all, that's what I mean by the answers may lie in the symptoms and the emotions rather than you're actually having a chain of memories that you can run through in your head. Okay, yeah. let's look at some tips and strategies for processing and healing. Um, you know, we make, Athena and I make a big deal, rightfully so, I believe, about working with therapists that are trauma-informed. It is so important. We don't always have that option. Either your insurance won't cover it or your insurance offers two therapists and neither one of them is trauma-informed or you live in a podunk little town where there's one therapist and they're not trauma-informed, or you have no insurance, and so therefore you can't see any therapist, let alone one that's trauma-informed. Um, this is especially critical if you have a history of preverbal abuse. Um, I, my therapist that I saw for five years, sorry, four hours a week, um, I moved, an hour and 15 minutes away and I still drove back to that city. So I drove five hours a week to see her because she was trauma informed and she knew and we had a therapeutic alliance. So am I telling you that you need to drive five hours a week to go to therapy? No, not if you're, I mean, that's, that's not always possible, but if you can, if it is an option, please, with preverbal abuse, please find someone who is trauma informed. And then find a therapist who either uses expressive therapies themselves or they will work in partnership with other therapists who use expressive therapy modalities. Okay, so maybe you have a therapist who's taken some classes in art therapy or they're competent in art therapy and they do art therapy with you in your therapy sessions. Great. If they don't, and you find an art therapist you want to work with a couple times a month or every week or whatever works for you, that's fine too. Just make sure that they will work in concert with one another. Um, because if they don't work in concert with one another, that's probably not in your best interest. So when you're looking for a therapist, find out if they're trauma-informed and then find out if they use expressive therapies. And if they don't, will they be willing to partner with a therapist who knows expressive modalities? 
And if they say no to those, I would personally walk away. Um, you may not have that option. I know we don't always have those options. If you have the option, I would move on to the next therapist that's on the list. Um, be patient with yourself and the healing process. Athena and I talked about this earlier, both of us. Um, recovery from preverbal abuse is challenging due to its absence of association with language and because we often learned dissociation when we were itty bitty as a way to cope. And dissociation makes the recovery process more difficult. And I can attest to that one. Yeah. Um, this last one is so important and it's one of my pet peeves in working with survivors, one of my serious pet peeves. Before you do any work to address preverbal abuse, you need to work on your dissociation coping mechanisms. If you are a survivor who dissociates as a way to cope with pain, you need to work on that. You need to work on being present and you need to work on grounding strategies before you try and dig at any, any part of your abuse. I mean, I'm talking, I don't care if you have five hours worth of tapes in your head from the time that you were, you know, seven to eight years old. You have the full memories. You know what happened. You got it. Um, no. The very first thing you need to work on is safety and grounding. Because the last thing that will be helpful to you is if you discuss your abuse in a therapy session and leave your therapist's office dissociated. It happens so often and it really yanks my chain because it is a therapist's job to help you get grounded and settled before you leave their office. Okay, so you need to communicate with your therapist and your ther therapist needs to accept that responsibility. So anytime that I do trauma work with someone who tends to dissociate, we will spend a little bit of time warming up, so to speak, and then I will always, always save at least 15 minutes at the end of the session to get them grounded and fully present again. And they will not leave my care until they are fully present again. Um, now sometimes, you, when, especially initially, you're not going to know. You may not know that you're dissociated when you leave. But once you realize that, the next time you come back to therapy, you say, look, I didn't realize it at the time, but last time when we worked on my trauma, I left dissociated and I was really, really upset for a long time. Before I leave this time, can you help me get grounded again? Um, because that's so important. Uh, it's just, therapy sessions should not leave you distraught. They should not leave you in a crisis situation. If that is happening to you, you're in the wrong place. That happened to me person. with my EMDR um, recently. Yeah. And that was a, not a good situation at all. And I haven't been back, so. It, like I said, it's one of my pet peeves and it happens so much more than I wish I would see it. Um, but again, some of that comes from uh, providers not being trauma informed and not clearly understanding the coping mechanism dissociation. Um, you know, you and I can look at someone and we can tell if they're dissociated. Other coaches and therapists, not so much because they don't see it to the extent that we see it. Um, but we know that glazed look in your eyes, you know, and that not really looking there, not really being there feeling. So, um, yeah, that's the end of the one page. And if you would like, it is available on our website, nomoreshameproject.com. Um, and what does the tab say again, Athena? Tell them again how they can get it. Oh, you can go to traumarecoveryuniversity.com or nomoreshameproject.com and click on the tab that says downloadables. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we have there some, we, go. Uh, we have some live video feed issues going on, guys. And if um, if that is you 
and the video has cut out completely. We are so sorry. Uh, we don't know what happened exactly. Uh, it looks like everybody dropped off. So we're not really sure what happened, but um, we're hoping that um, you can view the, the delayed recording. Replay? The replay. Thank you. <laughs> we're going to go ahead and um, we, I believe we answered as many of the, the Twitter questions um, that we can answer for this particular episode. We will have live Q&A next Monday as well. Um, this week is Thanksgiving week for the United States contingency. And so if you are here in the United States and this is Thanksgiving week for you, we would like to let you know that we have a video that we recorded about a year ago. I believe we recorded it on Thanksgiving, if I'm not mistaken, Bobby. Um, and I want to just remind you that Thanksgiving can be a very triggering and difficult time for a lot of adult survivors of child abuse. And you can go to our YouTube channel or our Roku TV channel and search for the word Thanksgiving, and you will find uh, the video specifically for Thanksgiving and how it can be triggering and how to navigate through that with a, either a large or small family situation going on, etc. So I uh, just wanted to throw that out there and we're going to be displaying our contact information, how to connect with us. And if you are looking to heal in safe community, we have an easy four step process. We have our contact information. We're going to give that to you, and then we have a page that says how to join our safe community, ways to join our safe community, and it will lead you through a four-step process using the, the ones that we showed you how to connect with us. So we're going to go through that right about now. If you are already familiar with that process and you don't need to know how to connect with us or how to be involved in our safe community, then we bid you a very, very lovely fond farewell, and we hope that we see you again next week on live Q&A Mondays. Uh, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, and here we go. Can you see it? I can see it perfectly. Thank you so much, Bobby. Yay! You're awesome. You're awesome. I wish I knew what happened to our live video. Feed, I know. Isn't that bizarre? I'm so sorry, you guys. We've never had that happen in the, what, year and a half that we've no. been doing this? Yeah, that's the first time. I'm hoping the replay is fine. I'm pretty yes. sure it is. But. Yes. Um. So again, like Athena was saying, we do three tw Twitter chats a week. The first one is Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time and 6 p.m. in the UK. And that Twitter chat was set up primarily for our UK audience because they kept having to come to chat at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, and the <laughs> it's, a, it's a good problem for us to have, though, because we get to serve you guys even more. So we love it. And we've gotten, so, we've gotten to meet so many new people because of the new time. So... <laughs> Um, the hashtag for that is CSAQT, which stands for Child Sexual Abuse Question Time. And then this that you're watching right now is an interactive video and Twitter chat. And the hashtag for that is No More Shame. That's 6 p.m. PST and 9 Eastern Time and Tuesday at 2 o'clock in the morning for the UK crowd. And then Tuesday night is the original Twitter chat, sex abuse chat, that's at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern, and Wednesday at 2 o'clock. Um, anytime, any week, you can watch us at um, bit.ly forward slash trauma recovery you, and yes, the capitals do matter on that one. Um, if you would like to join one of our Facebook communities, please. <laughs> I beg of you, follow this process. Um, I think we've got a pile of messages stacked up on the Trauma Recovery University webpage that we haven't been able to get to yet. So if you would like oh. as immediate as possible access to our support groups, please follow this process rather than messaging um, the Trauma Recovery University Facebook page. Um, and it's, it's simple. Just go ahead and like the Trauma Recovery University webpage and then send Athena and I both friend requests 
Um, I promise you we will accept them unless you made your profile yesterday and um, then you're probably going to have to explain to us why you just made your profile yesterday and so we can make sure that you're not somebody's abuser trying to sneak into the group and hurt someone. Um, so send us friend requests and whichever one gets to you first, um, we will accept your friend request and then send us a message. So wait for the friend request to get accepted because then if you send us a message before you our friend request is accepted, it will go in our other folder. And I can't even begin to tell you how many messages I have piled up in my other folder. So send a friend request when it's accepted, then send us a message that says, I would like to heal in safe community, and we will get you plugged in to one of the groups. We will. Um, we and promise. it's that simple. We promise. Yeah. I cut you off. I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. I have everybody tweeting in saying, so are you still recording? <laughs> Dang it. Okay, you guys. So we don't, we've never had this happen before. Uh, just want to say thank you to everyone who stuck there with us. Uh, not sure what happened and why the software kicked every single one of you out and you're no longer able to be here live with us. We're answering your tweets, but but you're not here with us live anymore. At least it doesn't say you're here. So um, anyway, yet another blooper, Bobby. Uh, this is just something that we're gonna have to be okay with, I guess. So it's, I'm sure we're not the only people in the world this is happening to. Other people use Google but, Plus you know, and YouTube. And, that's right. But if there's one thing, it's that um, Athena and I have the capacity to persevere. We so. do. We really do. <laughs> you can't get rid of us that easily, Google+. Plus. No, you can't. So thank you, thank you, thank you to each and every one of you. Bobby, do you have any parting thoughts for any of our people who are going to be watching this video a little bit later on? Um, no, the only thing that I can think of to tell you guys is that next week we're going to talk about post traumatic growth and that is an awesome uplifting topic we would love to have you come on back and learn about how you can use your recovery to your advantage and I want to I'm wording carefully because I don't want to say use your trauma to your advantage but use your recovery to your advantage so come join us next week Monday the 30th and everybody have a happy Thanksgiving unless you're in the UK then you could still have a happy Thanksgiving but and then the, the Canadians already had theirs about a month and a half ago yes <laughs> beginning of <laughs> October I believe um, you guys thank you for all your tweets that are still rolling in we we love you you guys are the reason why we show up every single week and we do want to um, I want to echo what Bobby said and say we would love to see you here next week as we talk about post-traumatic growth and just on the same topic that Bobby was getting at, which is we are not celebrating your trauma and we are not suggesting you use your trauma for your advantage and that it's so awesome, your trauma. What we are saying is your recovery journey that you're on, we can, we can see a bright side to what's going on in our recovery when we look at post-traumatic growth. And we have a dear community member of ours that attends Johns Hopkins, Brenda, and it's her favorite topic in the whole world. And it's one of my favorite topics as well. Not as much of a favorite as boundaries, because I think boundaries is like the foundation upon which every single thing in the whole wide world is built upon. So <laughs> it's just my, my theory, my hypothesis, but... Um, Bobby and I are really honored that you're here with us and we want to welcome you back next week. We love bringing you everything you need for healthy informed trauma recovery. So aloha and happy Thanksgiving to everyone in the United States from myself, Athena Moberg, and my amazing partner, Bobby Farish. And we will see you next week.